So check this out. We have something available called 30 Days of Coaching, uh, and we give it for free. And this is what it is. You, you, you go on our site, mindpumpmedia.com. You opt in, and you get access to uh, a bunch of different topics that we consider to be the most important uh, when people are getting started in fitness and wellness. Everything from basic topics like proteins, fats, carbohydrates, and calories to more complex topics like your metabolism to other topics uh, that, in, that are included in wellness, things like meditation. And what we do is we send you episodes where we've talked about these things in detail and we timestamp them so you can listen to what we say about these particular topics in detail. And plus, we give you more information. It's all free and it's our way of giving back to the Mind Pump listeners. And the way you get it is you go to mindpumpmedia.com and sign up and it costs nothing. So just recently, we had an opportunity to uh, hop on a show, Travis uh, Marziani, great kid, man. And we had an opportunity to try out his performance nut butter. And all of us absolutely loved it. Uh, this kid, it's really great to watch what he's doing and uh, just his work ethic, uh, the thought that he's put into putting this product out. It looks amazing. It tastes amazing. It's all it's all natural. It's keto. It's vegan. It's uh, it's uh, it's macadamia, coconut, and cashew nut butter all together, and it's phenomenal. And he's trying to launch this company. So one of the things about Mind Pump, we've kind of been this way since day one, is we've turned down a lot of people that we could have done affiliations with to make money. And one of the things we all agreed on is that we anything that we'd ever talk about would be stuff that we support. Even a company like this that can't pay us any money, isn't huge, isn't going to be a major affiliate. He's trying to launch his Indiegogo right now and get this business up and running. And we want to help support him. So if you guys want to help us out to help him, uh, go to mindpumpbutter.com. You could check out his Indiegogo right now and uh, try some of the stuff out. Even if you guys just try a simple sample, it helps him out. And uh, you'll see, you'll love it because I know all of us love it. So, and give us great feedback, please, afterwards because uh, anything we can do to help support him and help him grow this business. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go Mind Pump, Mind Pump, with your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. Holy uh, shit, we're finally dropping the Dom D. Oh my God. So, we know you guys, I, if, you, I, if you have been fasting, Is waiting it Christmas? for Christmas. You may be dead. Yeah. I know. I know. We've had fans that have been waiting to hear the Dom D episode. Mm. We have been waiting for approval from NASA. Those yeah. motherfuckers yeah. over there. He's not lying. That's the truth. We recorded this episode a long time ago. Dom came to visit us. We recorded an awesome podcast with him. We talked about, of course, ketogenic nutrition. Well, we talked yeah. about super top secret shit that goes down with NASA, and that was the mm. reason he, he right away said, "Listen, boys." As much fun as we had, all the great stuff that we revealed and talked about, you cannot release that episode until I get approval from NASA. We literally got the approval yesterday. Yeah. We're dropping it. We just got it. NASA stamped. We are dropping it for you guys so you guys can now listen to it. You guys get insider information on what's going up on Mars. This is pretty before cool. Before anybody else knows. This is pretty cool. Now, Dom, Dom was selected as one of only four crew members for the NASA Extreme Environment Missions Operations Expedition. He's going to go to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean for 10 days on June 18th, simulating a deep space mission with similar objectives for exploration on Mars. And I think this is about how to use ketones and all that stuff. It's a great episode. You're going to love it. So here yeah. we are talking to Dr. Dom Diagostino. You know, Dom, what's, you know, we're talking about business and things like that. Um, you know, and you're a major research guy. So what it, how do you look at what you're doing, like business wise, like the future of what you're doing? Do you even care about, like, do you have any sort of monetary drive whatsoever? You just research, like, where's your head at with that? Uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting topic. Cause, uh, we were discussing that walking here, actually. Um, uh, we realized that a lot of people are latching on to what we're doing, whether it be an idea, um, or intellectual property even that we're generating through and, and making a lot of money. And I would like to develop a model, which is kind of outside of convention from an academic uh, academia perspective, but to develop a model where um, the, the public interest in what we're doing is generating revenue that can feed back into developing the science and the application uh, of the things that we're doing, whether it be a specialized ketogenic diet, a supplement, or um, 
a very comprehensive, you know, metabolic based therapy for whether it be cancer, epilepsy, or Navy, uh, you know, Navy SEAL application mm-hmm. or, or NASA application <laughs> or something like that. But to develop a business model, and and I think it's going to take some thought and creativity and uh, maybe innovation to do it. That instead of trying to beg the government, the NIH, I saw is getting like a 20% uh, cut in their funding. And that's where I'm supposed to be getting, you know, money for mm-hmm. for my research, but to, to do it through other channels. And uh, because you really need to keep reinventing yourself and be innovative. If you're uh, uh, a researcher, uh, an investigator that wants to fund the lab and pay salaries and I think the challenge that you have with that is um, what you guys, I'm sure you guys are aware of, is from the research uh, side, from the science side, you follow uh, these protocols. You have hypotheses, you test them, you, you, um, you know, there's peer reviewed process. The market side doesn't have any of that. So you could come out and be like, hey, you know, it looks like maybe, you know, ketones uh, might have, you know, points in the direction that might have a fat burning quality, but we're going to study further and we're going to look deeper into that. And the next thing you know, there's five supplement companies like right. fat burner with new ketones. Yeah. Already making a shit ton of money yeah. off the research that you started. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. that's the challenge is competing with that speed. That's uh, yeah. After, you know, making the claims, um, they need to point to the science. So that's, I mean, we're reaching out to the companies that are selling these products and oh. saying, hey, if you are going to make these claims, mm. you got to put your, you know, your pocketbook where your mouth is mm-hmm. and start funding studies. There's a lot of neurological applications, potentially performance, anti-cancer, things like that from preclinical animal data and maybe, you know, some emerging human studies. But uh, I mean, I'm, 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 going to call companies out and say, yeah, you know, that's I'm, awesome. well, we're kind of the people who started, started this and you're misrepresenting Excellent. the technology mm-hmm. and the supplements by, by doing that. I think a good way to do that would be to be really open with that rather than contacting them privately, yeah. having a site and saying these are the following supplement companies are making uh, erroneous claims uh, in regards to ketones and then list yeah. them because that would be like, if I was a supplement company, that'd be the last place right. I'd want my my company to be on. And so that sounds like a great page for Mind Pump Media. I feel yeah. like yeah. <laughs> well, if you don't do it, we'll do we it. Say, well, we, might might, we might have yeah. to talk more into this after this podcast yeah. is over because I feel like that's what we're. Was well, that about. like Examine.com? They 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 do a little bit of like vetting with that. Right? I yeah. love Examine.com, yeah, yeah. but they don't call specific. They don't like call specific companies out. Yeah, like they don't. Okay. They don't. They don't get that aggressive. I mean, we we have no problem getting that aggressive, but I can no, see that because then because yeah. now you're looking at like fire with fire you know what i mean because Mm -hmm. they're really crafty at Mm -hmm. maneuvering around and taking their time and then Mm -hmm. finally they get five letters from you and oh no looks like we're going to court fine we're going to stop or we're going to change our our wording a little bit by that point now you know millions of people Mm -hmm. have bought their shit right yeah uh, the the message is out we've sent a lot of cease and desist to various companies uh and you know i have actually called them out more like to their lawyers or our, our university did and the model that I encourage companies to do is to do, uh, you know, edu- to educate, to bring, to pay people like, you know, Rob Wolf and, and academics and, and scientists to actually speak to the distributors and the representatives who are marketing this technology and before and have that mandatory before they go out and, and do sales and be, you know, they they would, the company would pay for that mm-hmm. to happen because otherwise they could be shooting themselves in the foot if they go out there and make all these crazy claims without promoting the science. By science, I mean peer-reviewed publications, and there's quite a lot of it out there. And it's going, if you look on PubMed, it's going up exponentially. because It's growing. There was so much interest right now in, in your yeah, field. But they need to understand what the what these supplements are are and what they are not and and by promoting what they are not that's kind of shooting themselves in the foot now dom what are some of the crazy claims that you're seeing right now you don't have to name companies or anything but what are some of the things you're seeing that you're like no that's not accurate or we just don't know yet Mm. in regards to you know ketone science or ketogenic science well there's quite a few but uh, (laughs) uh, the scenario that happens is that you get one or two people that get this crazy response they lose like a hundred pounds and then they're promoting the ketone supplement mm. for that and they just happen to be a distributor too so and, oh, convenient uh, so this is the, the the scenario um 
you know, I do get a lot of emails from people who do not go public with their story from uh, parents that have kids, for example. So the, the, the ketogenic diet, you guys probably know, the only clinical application for it is for seizure disorders. Mm-hmm. And, and it works remarkably well for that, even when drugs fail. And in some cases, it doesn't work or it doesn't give full seizure control. But uh, And supplements should not be marketed for this yet. But uh, they, when used in conjunction with a ketogenic diet, they can further augment the therapeutic efficacy of the ketogenic diet to the point where it is now controlling seizures mm. for a lot of times for very specific metabolic disorders, but even for just general epilepsy. But you have that will come out, some, some kind of story or anecdotal report will come out and then companies will say, oh, look, it's the supplement. It's not the diet where it's usually the diet and the supplement, you know, the, the, combined yeah like the the parents are working with johns hopkins you know clinical dietitian to set up the diet and it's not quite working to where they want it and then they add a supplement they kind of go outside of the realm of conventional medicine and then supplement companies will sometimes uh, harp on that and say look the diet cures epilepsy mm-hmm. or the the ketone supplement cures epilepsy well uh, so so we know that's pretty established now that um a ketogenic diet um in in ketones benefit uh people with uh epilepsy or epileptic uh like disorders uh but there's lots of anecdote out there with ketogenic diets on almost all neurological type disorders yeah even brain injury which is a big one concussions and that could be probably one of the biggest so uh, so why is that because obviously it's not specific to the, the the disorder of epilepsy there's obviously some general you know, thing that it's doing at, 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 at its mm-hmm. core that is benefiting all these issues that you may have yeah. with your brain and neurological system. What is that? Is why it, why is, is that, that happening? Ketones are just a, a cleaner fuel for us, for the brain. Is that what it is? Uh, that's a part of it. But like with traumatic brain injury, what you have is uh, – if you do a scan on someone like a soldier or even a guy that takes a big hit to the head and you look at, you do a, uh, and what's called an FDG PET scan, a glucose PET scan, and that's dim in certain areas, that's your best predictor about how that guy will recover, right? And if it's a penetrating traumatic brain injury, like uh, from an IED or something like that, you have an 85% chance that you're going to have seizures with that because mm. seizures are really common with multiple concussions and even with what, hard hit, you know, traumatic brain injury. So it makes sense to use a diet that we know is more effective than drugs for seizures to, to do that for TBI. But the faster you restore normal brain energy metabolism, the faster that you're going to recover from traumatic brain injury. And also the the neuroinflammation and i just get, i went to um europe and, and had a talk on this now they have a scan that can ju- look at inflammation in the brain and the diet seems to be working in that regard and we know ketones have a, an anti-inflammatory effect hmm. so they may be working not only by restoring normal brain energy metabolism or homeostasis but suppressing some of the neuroinflammation that's associated with cte which is that chronic inflammation that the guys get uh, like the NFL, right? Didn't they have a big thing with the NFL? With yeah, that? yep. And there's a particular pathway called the NLRP3 inflammasome, and there was a paper published in Nature Medicine. I actually formulated the diet for Dr. Deep Dixit at Yale, and and that and he showed that it inhibited a specific inflammatory pathway that's kind of tightly associated with neuroinflammation and, and traumatic brain injury. So that's that's just an example of one of the pathways independent of metabolism that could be, you know, and maybe that inflammation plays a role in epilepsy. We know that when guys get certain neuro, neuroinflammatory disorders, even a, a virus, you know, various viruses like uh, even like herpes simplex virus or shingles, Some a couple people were emailing me when they get it, they were getting... Uh, uh, epilepsy or getting seizures and when they would get a breakout. Hmm. And we know that that virus causes neuroinflammation. And we know that the ketogenic diet or ketones can suppress that. So it may be working not only through metabolic-based mechanisms, which you know most people are studying, but we're looking into the immune system and inflammation. Actually, a big part of uh, Andrew Kutnick's uh, research as a PhD student is to look at the immune system and the the inflammatory markers that are associated with ketone supplementation. Mm. Is uh, is glucose metabolism or you know working with carbohydrates is that inherently inflammatory on its own and is removing that part of the the, the process? I mean, that's a tough question to kind of a general thing to ask, but uh, you know, I'm wondering yeah. if. How much of an effect comes from uh, just the, the ketones themselves and how much of an effect comes from 
possibly yeah. just the elimination of you know carbohydrates? That's a good question. So when you take a, a hit to the head, or even if you have a neurological disorder, uh, two things will impair glucose metabolism, including uh, lower activity of pyruvate dehydrogenase complex or PDH complex. It's kind of like the gatekeeper to your metabolism. And with brain injuries, there's, al there's also an internalization of the glucose transporter. In neurons, that would be the GLUT3 transporter. So you have less transporter at the membrane, so the cells can't suck up glucose. And if they do suck up glucose, the rate-limiting enzyme, PDH complex, is less active, right? So ketones can bypass that. They have a different uh, transporter that mm. can get the ketone across the membrane. And they go, they're metabolized into ATP, our energy currency, completely independent of PDH complex. So there's actually a disorder called pyruvate dehydrogenase complex deficiency syndrome. And the only therapy used clinically for kids that have this is the ketogenic diet. Mm. So, uh, and we know the prime cause of TBI brain, you know, energy impairment is a dysregulation of PDH and, in, and a dysregulation of the uh, transporters at the membrane, they get internalized, you know, they, they basically get sucked out of the membrane. So the glucose, so the ketones can then restore I, energy metabolism. So, so then um, am I being accurate by saying uh, just kind of you, what you're saying? So basically uh, acute trauma uh, reduces this uh, PD, PDH complex, PDH yeah. complex, and the GLUT three. Did you say uh, the GLUT three transporter? GLUT three transporter. Okay. So, so acute uh, acute trauma reduces those, and if you don't bypass them, it's almost like you're starving. Yeah, and then you have excess glucose. I think maybe that was so getting to the question. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you have uh, a surplus of glucose in the cerebrospinal fluid, the CSF. Wow. And and in your, you know, there's actually this acute insulin resistance too to your body trauma, mm. and that can cause inflammation, something called advanced glycation end products or AEGs, and that can wreak havoc and cause uh, or havoc can cause uh, membrane lipid peroxidation. It can epigenetically wow. suppress, you know, or, or trigger pro-inflammatory pathways. So when you, whenever you have a surplus of glucose floating around in your brain, in your body, that's going to trigger a cascade of inflammatory. Wow. Yeah. So, so somebody gets hurt, they get injured. Uh, we need to hurry up and circumvent their normal energy pathway because it's already, it's already messed up. And if we don't, we're going to get more inflammation, potentially starve you know, brain cells starve the body from being able to utilize energy. So you go ketogenic and it bypasses that um, in those particular circumstances. Are there other things, because what I've noticed, this is all anecdote now, but uh, I've been in fitness for a very long time. I've worked with lots and lots of people and some people just seem to thrive on ketogenic type dieting and others mm -hmm. don't, it doesn't make a huge difference. And I'm comparing healthy diet to healthy diet. I'm not comparing shitty diet to ketogenic diet, right? But some people seem to do phenomenal on it. Would that could is it safe to say that perhaps they have some of those, so some of those d disorders in in regards to energy metabolism, like you were talking about, but like on, in, a, on but, a smaller scale, but not from an acute injury. Maybe their mm -hmm. lifestyle, or maybe just the you know their their you know they have some kind of genetic yeah. polymorphism. Yeah, it, yeah, that, that actually could very well be the case. So you know, some people are just less carbohydrate tolerant. So they're carbohydrate intolerant. So if they keep feeding carbohydrates, they have a baseline elevation of high glucose, high insulin, and then they get on a ketogenic diet and it restores them to basically normal health. And, mm -hmm. and some yeah. guys will start, you know, making ketones immediately. And, and we do have a, a very broad range of fatty acid oxidation enzyme activities. And there's like, uh, you know, for fat oxidation, pathways, there's like 12 different enzymes and you could have variations, different SNPs that will determine whether, you know, you're five times more higher activity of HNG CoA lyase or whatever, some kind of enzyme that either makes ketones or involved in fat oxidation. And we vary across the spectrum in that. And I think some of the, the technologies that are being developed, you know, you take 23andMe data and you put it into some of these uh, programs that are coming out like NutriTracker and other things will will give you insight and information into uh, whether or not, you know, the ketogenic diet may be for you. And mm. I think that's kind of the future. We're not yet there with the technology, but I think we're, it's evolving into that direction where mm. we may be able to predict uh, the, the diet that may be optimal for us. And then we can just kind of 
start it and maybe some simple physiological or biochemical biomarkers to track whether or not we're adapting to that diet well Interesting. but yeah. some people like the diet just doesn't work for them and they keep trying it and they keep <laughs> trying it all yeah. the time <laughs> yeah and it's like if it's not working for you then, yeah. <laughs> then you know <laughs> don't working. stop it yeah. yeah i had somebody message me and they're like yeah i've been trying a ketogenic diet and i you know i'm not pooping every day and i feel horrible and i'm like how long have you been doing like 60 days i'm like yeah you probably should stop yeah. Yeah. <laughs> those weren't enough signs for you or what? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. we have to be very careful. I remember even after, so uh, after we had you on the show, uh, or was it before we went ketogenic? Did we go before or Dom? I don't know. Right around that right time. Around that it was time. either right before we had you, right after, you know, we all kind of said, hey, you know, let's let's run the ketogenic diet for a while and just kind of assess ourselves, what we feel and notice and yeah. share with our audience. And uh, we were very fascinated with it. It completely changed my relationship uh, with fats, with carbohydrates. My diet's, I mean, I've been in fitness for over 15 years and it's completely flipped it on its head for me. Mm -hmm. So it was huge for me. And we all kind of shared our, our stories and, Man, after that, it became like, you know, ketogenic diet was like the mind pump diet. And we had to be, we had to like back everybody up, like, listen, pump your brakes here. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff we don't know. It's not for everybody. You know, these are just some of the things, the dots that we're connecting. And we don't want to come out and say like, this is the official diet. And in fact, none of us actually run like a pure ketogenic diet all the time. That just, like I said, it changed my relationship with fat and carbs. And mm -hmm. I, th I feel like that's part of our responsibility is to <clears throat> continue to tell people that as, as good information is coming out is because you know, leave it up to all the morons out there. They get a little bit of a science or a little bit of information and they fucking run with it, you know, and then create supplements around it and then try and promote the shit out of it and monetize it. That's yeah. so, uh, so, I mean, I don't think it's, it's not debatable that the ketogenic diet has got real uh, applications for particular situations, uh, whether it be uh, disease, disease, disorder, acute issues, but let's talk about the healthy average person what are the potential benefits and detriments or maybe detriments that can come from eating a ketogenic diet? Because most of our audience uh, is just the average person who just is working out, wants to get healthier. Mm -hmm. What kind of information can we give them in regards to eating this way? Yeah, I would say the ketogenic diet as it's defined clinically, you know, if you look it up on Wikipedia, is not the kind of diet that you'd want to follow unless mm -hmm. you're you know, attempting to metabolically manage some kind of like, uh, you know, disorder that's that's drug resistant or, or not. Or and the medical disorder. And the medical yeah. ketogenic diet, what's the macro breakdown? It's something like 70% uh, fat or? It's like 90. It's well, it's 85 oh, wow. to, it's a four to one ratio. Classical Johns Hopkins ketogenic oh, okay. diet is about 90% fat mm. and about, uh, yeah, like 8% protein and that's you know for pediatric epilepsy okay but uh as the diet evolved and the applications evolved uh dr eric kossoff a uh, neurologist at johns hopkins kind of has brought about the use of the modified atkins mm -hmm. which i think is kind of what a lot of you guys are following which is more liberal with protein mm -hmm. so you're you can upwards of 20 typically 25 and even upwards of 30 percent protein and the balance being uh uh, fat, you know, now we understand, you know, certain fats are, are better than others and to eliminate certain polyunsaturated plant-based fats uh, and do monounsaturated fats are probably the ideal fat to have. And um, and carbohydrates at, you know, five and even in some cases up to 10% if they are, you know, of a certain fiber content mm. uh, can be can be added in. But, um, but so the modified Atkins diet is probably the one that would be most applicable to the general audience. And I think as we age, our carbohydrate tolerance decreases mm -hmm. as we age. And that needs to be recognized. And I think we could probably, uh, you don't, and I was talking to Andrew about this, you know, the other day, if, if I would go back to, you know, back when I was playing football in high school, if I did a abruptly change to a ketogenic diet, I think my performance would tank and mm -hmm. I probably would not be able to put on any mm -hmm. weight at all. But now that I'm in my 40s, uh, I think a ketogenic diet, my body thrives on it. I mean, I could not never go back to eating, you know, growing up in an Italian family and and shoveling pasta in my mouth almost every night. And I did I did well on a ketogenic. I always stayed lean, and my body I had really high carbohydrate tolerance. You know, my nieces and nephews are basically like mainlining sugar and carbs all day, and they look like <laughs> yeah. little anatomy charts. And uh, so they are obviously very carbohydrate tolerant and do really well. Uh, but uh, over the years, I find that, you know, my level of carbohydrate tolerance decreases with time, and I just feel better. And my energy is sustained longer. I don't have dips 
Uh, I don't have shifts in my energy level. Is this something that they've seen uh, mm. in any type of study where they can find they show that 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 carbohydrate right does it hit a certain starts- saturation point where now you start to get sort of diminishing returns going forward from that? Uh, as far as what, like, as far as like, is, is I'm on, I'm eating, uh, you know, carbohydrates like primarily and like going through and I'm growing up, like eating a ton of carbohydrates. Is there a point where, you know, like you said, like as you get older, yeah. Yeah. When does the switch happen? Uh, I think it's largely dependent upon your activity level, obviously, Mm -hmm. but I think, um, hormones too i mean your insulin sensitivity when you're growing up through the teenage years especially is just really high even through your early 20s mm-hmm. and everything so your uh, body is much more responsive to like anabolic hormones so mm-hmm. protein synthesis is just happening at a, a faster rate you're repairing muscle tissue faster so i think all those energy dependent processes are sensitive to glucose and insulin and you're more likely to have a better um glucose disposal and insulin sensitivity when you're younger and growing and more active. And as we age and start sitting behind our desks and doing, Mm -hmm. you know, 90% of the day is basically inactive. Either we're sleeping or behind the desk and 10% we're active. Uh, That's kind of, well, maybe the kids today are like that, but uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's uh, when I was growing up, I was pretty much half, you know, more than half a day. I was just running around Mm -hmm. doing stuff, working on a farm, like constantly active. Do you think maybe that it's just a, just a chronic like, like, you know, from because I grew up yeah. in an Italian family, too. And it's like I just ate carbohydrates all the time. And maybe after a while, my body's like, no, like yeah, that's yeah. enough, you know. And I, I think our mitochondrial capacity to uh, decreases with time. And mm. it's inevitable. I mean, it's part of the aging process. Right. Uh, but I think what's interesting about the ketogenic diet, when you force your body away from glycolysis, away from sugar, it's forced to metabolize fats and ketones for energy. And when you do that, and it's well established that uh, it's a stress initially, but your body, there's mitochondrial bioener- you know, uh, biosynthesis. So you have more uh, mitochondria over time and the efficiency of the mitochondria increases. Uh, there's more mitochondrial biogenesis. So uh, these are th- real things that happen over time. It's been shown in animal models and athletes too. It's kind of the effect of exercise, but even independent of exercise, if you were to shift the macronutrient profile of the diet to higher in fats, you make more mitochondria. And that's, I consider that like energy reserves. So by having more mitochondria, by forcing your mitochondria to work harder, uh, the hormetic response or whatever you want to, you have more metabolic flexibility. You can go back to eating carbs and glucose and then when you shift back to fats again you have the mitochondria there that are uh, responsible for beta oxidation of fats to make energy so i think you know training your body to burn fat and ketones for energy and periodically you know using glucose uh, under certain situations i think is w- would be ideal for the average person if th- that's where you're getting at, I think, like an average person yeah and I, I anecdotally that's how i do it now mm-hmm. um and uh, i had um some autoimmune issues uh years ago and i found that eating more fats and less carbohydrates just made me feel better and i've gradually you know uh moved towards a you know being in ketosis a lot of the times but I did find that if I went out and in every once in a while, I would get boosts in performance in the gym. And just all of a sudden, I would get these great effects from the ketogenic diet again, like I, like I had before. And from an evolutionary standpoint, it kind of makes sense, right? Like, why would we have the ability to use both, you know, glucose and ketones? Like, it seems like we yeah. found if we found fruit and we found tubers, we're going to eat the hell out of them. And if we didn't, then we just ate the meat that was around us. So yeah. it, would you say that's beneficial to go back and forth? And Yeah. Okay. Our it, body knows what to do. I think there's a lot of confusion mm-hmm. out there that if you do eat this way and then go back, you know, you'll have insulin resistance or whatever. But I think it's kind of good to stay uh, for the average person, unless you're managing like, you know, some kind of um, disorder uh, to, to switch in and out. And uh, yeah, I think we're designed to do that. And I think our bodies kind of work better uh, when there's relative changes, like, um, and I think it's better to adapt in that way. We're much more metabolically flexible. Tom, when you, when you look at, uh, the younger generation coming up as a whole, right. And I know everyone's individualized here, but if as a whole, it, what, what's the advice you give w- uh, to someone like that, as far as, uh, you know, maybe the eating habits that they're creating, you know, in their teens and 20 and 20 years old, what, 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 what do you see, 
yeah, um, is a problem or that could become a problem for them? And how would you advise somebody in that age group? That what would you say? Uh, are you saying for like the like just, just saying teenage, general? Yeah, well, yeah, because yeah. we know like well, I mean, obesity is on the rise. We have more information yeah, out yeah. there, right? We have the, the science is better, but yet we're, we're it, this is we're just fatter and yeah, we're getting so that to me, I feel like okay, mm-hmm. well then. What's going on here? This doesn't make sense to me. So someone with that's a scientist like you that does a lot of research and understands the effect of carbohydrates and fats and the benefits of ketogenic diet, you know, and if if you were advising a, a younger person that's coming up and, you know, eating Captain Crunch for breakfast and then Pop-Tart before he does his workout and then smashing his, you know, protein bar. And then, I mean, this is kind of like his, his day, which was yeah. a lot of how I ate, you know, growing right. up, you know, what what would you say to someone like that? Well, I would look at what they're doing and kind of say, you know, how's that working for you? And, uh, <laughs> and then analyzing w- what they're doing and uh, to bring them back. I mean, we, we just put in a grant uh, uh, in, in El Paso because there's a big problem there with the, the community, the kids and the adult population. Obesity is skyrocketing. Really? And it's, uh, it's kind of like uh, – it's very hard to get like whole foods and, and packaged foods and sugary drinks are just off mm-hmm. the charts there. Mm-hmm. So it, it represents a really big problem. So you'd have to look at, at the people and actually look specifically at what they're doing, what they're putting into their bodies and their activity levels. It's multifactorial, but a lot of it has to do, uh, many people kind of know, well, not always know what to do, but it's their relationship. It's their psychological relationship with food. Like they may not necessarily need a nutritionist they may need like a nutritional psychotherapist like if they need to change their relationship that they have with their food because they are going to you know their go-to comfort foods are the things that they gravitate couldn't towards agree more. Do you, later on I couldn't do agree. you think it's purely psychological or do you think that some of these foods have addictive properties to them too the physiological changes and the neuropharmacology of the brain literally changes in ways that make us psychologically dependent upon uh foods and even generally speaking macronutrient ratios of foods like mm. you know certain, so it's both yeah. so you could say yeah. it's engineered somewhat right yeah yeah, yeah. oh and come it, on yeah. you know how much money these, these, these massive <laughs> some people want to miss that though this was a little area yeah. that that we didn't see quite eye to eye with lane i know we're all good friends with lane and, yeah. and sal loves the jab at him in this area we all are a yeah, little yeah, group right, thread. To poke the bear and, I, talk, I talk to lane about this a lot yeah yeah, yeah. this is and, what yeah what tell me what your, your thoughts on this well uh there's no doubt, and I think Lane will even agree that. So my perspective is when it comes to, you know, and the, the big thing is kind of weight loss and body composition changes. You know, getting leaner, and that comes down to being able to control, you know, the psychology of, of your food, and that comes down to appetite and being satiated. And and I think Lane will even agree, and many coaches out there need to look at the data and will agree that if you're following a diet that causes less postprandial excursions in glucose and and insulin uh it's going to change your appetite so our our desire to eat or to binge i would say which is a problem if we're calorie restricting for any period of time uh is a result of a, a hypoglycemic event like if our if we have like normal blood glucose and do not dip into hypoglycemic zones we're not going to have these cravings that really send us over the edge and i think you could do that with uh, you know and if it fits your macros kind of metabolic <laughs> uh you don't approach. feel like that's kind of flirting it, that, flirting with it though like you, you can do that but some people can do that if you have willpower but the ketogenic diet or just you don't even have to be ketogenic just you know carbo- high fat carbohydrate level. restriction you know low low carbs um uh, moderate uh fat even in high protein diet would work because protein has a satiating mm-hmm. effect too but the carbohydrate restriction component seems to be really important at least initially to kind of fix people's metabolism and then they can titrate carbs back in depending on their goals or what they want to do. But that's, that's the culprit and it's controlling appetite. And there seems to Mm. be some differences between, um, even between ethnicities, there's some like polymorphisms, like Mm -hmm. native Americans and Hispanics, for example, seem to have much high, well, they do statistically much higher rates of things like diabetes and insulin resistance, eating the same Western diet than, you know, that the rest of Americans do. 
Uh, do you guys ever look into that? Because I, I'm, I'm, you know, there's some theories, right, that maybe the Native yeah. Americans were hunter gatherers for longer, yeah. and they weren't into, you know, they didn't go through the agricultural revolution like we did, and so, you yeah. know, their, their bodies don't respond the same. And they're the population, really, the group that I was working with that we put in, a group in El Paso? together. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, they. You know, it's such a challenge for these people, the the families and the kids too. It becomes such a stress for them to count their calories. So we talk about, you know, flexible mm. dieting, but if you're flexible dieting and eating the same foods, you know, and you're hungry all the time. So the good thing about carbohydrate restriction or the ketogenic diet, you lose weight inadvertently. You're not even trying to do it. Mm. Like it, it normalizes your appetite uh, and you become satiated to the point where, your brain auto-regulates and you eat according to your body's needs or your energy levels. Whereas if you're spiking glucose a couple times a day, even with a perfect flexible dieting macronutrient ratio, you're still you know, spiking glucose more if it's a carbohydrate-based diet and you're getting these postprandial dips in glucose that's triggering hunger. And it's the, in, in that population that you just mentioned that are classically insulin resistant, uh, for a variety of reasons, um, uh, mostly g- genetically to some point, but there's some kind of behavioral things too there. Uh, it just makes sense to mm-hmm. do uh, to use this approach. Or you can you know create a flexible dieting scenario where you have a, a toolbox of different approaches that you could do and and just do a flexible dieting scenario with a, a low carb or mm-hmm. ketogenic. And I know Lane is very interested in doing that too. And and the the guys who practice this are becoming more interested in it because they're reaching out and contacting me. In mm-hmm. fact, you know, when you say that, I I could tell you right now, um, trying to gain weight eating ketogenic is much, hard as shit. Much more difficult hard, to do. Yeah. And in fact, one of the reasons why I go out of it sometimes is I just I'll just keep losing weight. And, yeah. uh, is that, is that primarily, do you, th- is it just the appetite suppression or is this, is there also another fat burning or weight loss thing that's going on there that's causing, you know, your body to want to lose weight? Mm, I know that's a million yeah. dollar question, right? Yeah. I think, you know, I've probably lost a good 20. 20 pounds since I've been doing this. But then again, my work has become, you know, much more intense. I spend long days in the lab and I generally eat two meals instead of trying to force feed six or eight per day. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I have, it's been really amazing the amount of muscle and strength I can maintain doing hardly any, like getting hardly getting to the gym at all or Mm -hmm. or eating very minimal. Um, So when it comes to losing, you know, with the ketogenic diet, if you are losing weight, the the thing to do is to increase your protein and uh, keep kind of your carb fat ratio the same uh, mm. or actually just start putting in, titrating in more protein in and around your workouts, I think can can help okay. a mm. lot. Or on the days, you know, that uh, I, I always say about the 12 hours after your workout is when you really want to drive protein synthesis. Okay. Let's talk about yeah. um, exogenous ketones because I know you're like deep in that in that particular realm of this. Um, what are you guys looking at uh, right now with exogenous ketones? What are the applications for taking just a ketone supplement? Yeah, the, the original application was was pretty, I guess, esoteric, I guess, <laughs> I guess you would say. It, would, it was for CNS oxygen toxicity seizures. And that's a limitation of Navy SEAL divers or special operations divers or even recreational divers that use a closed circuit rebreather. What was the, re- you gave a number, I think uh, I heard you talk about what's the, how many of those guys would experience that before you started doing this research? Uh, it very, well, <laughs> the problem is uh, if they do report it, they kind of get in trouble and they may, they may pull them. Oh, so it's, wow, it's grossly underreported. Oh, so wow. what I've, you know, done is kind of connect with the rebreather diving community, these tech divers that are using uh, the closed circuit rebreathers. And they say it's happening all the time. You know, uh, they're getting like, you know, uh, eye twitches or, or kind of weird auras and have to surface quick or even on the fly change their ga- breathing gas mixtures. Uh, it varies. So you can You can prevent it pretty easily, actually, if you just dive within the limits of your, and the Navy has certain uh, uh, limits as far as how deep you are at just 10, at just 50 feet of seawater, you can get a, 
you can get a seizure in 10 minutes and that's mm-hmm. not but with these rebreathers that the seals use they just you typically have to stay very shallow just to stay out of and there's no bubble so you can sneak up on guys and shoot them mm-hmm. and uh, that's the idea but sometimes if you're taking fire from a 50 caliber gun or you got to go down and Deeper. put a and put a, a a mine on a ship or you know there was a dozen of different scenarios guys would tell me about or they would just have to because the enemy's there they have to stay under longer they they can't surface so if your 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 dive computer or the table say hey you got to go up but the enemy is there with a gun you know you got to stay down so um so in in those situations that can be fatal to the mission and fatal to the guy too right because a seizure underwater is uh so oxygen toxicity seizures in and of themselves are not detrimental if you're in a hyperbaric chamber you know because you as soon as you lower uh the the partial pressure of oxygen by just uh put, putting in air in place of 100 percent oxygen you knock right out of the seizure mm-hmm. so if you're diving all that means you just need, need to surface up so it's very underreported to answer your question, uh, and it's being studied now. We studied it in rats and showed that you could feed rats a high carbohydrate diet and give them a ketone ester, and it would increase their latency to seizure five hundred and seventy five percent. So instead of seizing in ten minutes, you could go over an hour. Huge difference at uh, one hundred and thirty two feet of seawater, which is five atmospheres, and. And so we started studying that, and now we're looking into – now you have something. It's not an anti-epileptic drug, which would make your thinking foggy and slow you down physically, but it's a an energy molecule that you can consume that protects your brain in that environment, and it's also feeding your body a source of energy that can potentially enhance performance. Mm-hmm. So as you know, like the cycling community is all over this, and we're – doing experiments in rats we put them on like a treadmill like device like a rotor rod and they and when we get the dosage and the formula right they can run faster and longer and uh it just becomes like another fuel like uh creatine in regards to you know uh intense strength training it's ketones are like the next creatine for i agree you know yeah, you know, a range of different things. I actually, be, I, I saw after we talked to you, I actually bought some online and I noticed, uh, ma- mainly it was an endurance, uh, boost. I yeah. just work out and work out and work out. And I felt like I keep going. Yeah. So that works for people who eat carbohydrates. So if I'm, if I'm eating a regular diet, I could take exogenous ketones and go cycle. And I'm going to notice, uh, what they're showing is that you're getting a boost in endurance. So you don't need to be on a ketogenic diet to notice that. Well, that's studies that we need to do, okay, <laughs> right? Okay. So the animal work supports that. Uh, and the anecdote supports that. I have a lot of friends that do it that way. Yeah, there's elite level cyclists, you know, that will are experimenting with this stuff. Uh, and there's a few, a couple publications that are out looking at it and, you know, pretty high impact journals like Cell Metabolism that show kind of an increase in, in time to exhaustion and, and things like that. Uh, it needs to be further you know, explored as to what is the, and there's dozens of different types of ketone supplements out there, which make it even more interesting. Cause mm-hmm. I think re- the real benefits come in formulating something that's not just ketones, but ketones and other, other energy metabolites and cofactors that make those energy metabolites, uh, be able to be utilized more efficiently in the cells. Interesting. So that's, we're really excited about formulating things. Yeah, because right now on the market, I think the one I got was uh, was just beta-hydroxybutyrate, right? Just in uh, salt, I think. Yeah. It's yep. Just salt. And in the studies, you guys are using something else? Uh, well, we use, you can make, you can combine beta-hydroxybutyrate to many different uh, molecules, you know, and call it a salt. If okay. it's combined with sodium, uh-huh. it's a it's a sodium That's salt. That's, I think, the you one could, I used, yeah. And you could combine it with potassium, magnesium, any monovalent or divalent cation or even amino acids. So that really, uh, and if you spread the beta-hydroxybutyrate across many different uh, electrolytes or minerals and even amino acids, that allows you to be able to take in more of it. Because if you just make a sodium one, you're getting a bit of a sodium overload. Or if you make a magnesium oh, one, and that becomes you're a limiting be factor. Crapping it out, yeah. Oh, <laughs> so, oh wow, so, yeah. So it's that. That's, that's exciting. Formulate, you know, the ketogenic diet makes you deficient in some things like potassium, for example, and even mm-hmm. magnesium. I was deficient in magnesium, and until I started supplementing, and I felt much better. I didn't get cramps. And uh, some of the supplements on the market are combining beta-hydroxybutyrate with magnesium, and that shot my magnesium levels up 
really well in the top end of normal where I was in the bottom end of normal. Mm. And the magnesium supplements on the market are kind of pricey. And the ones that are cheap, like magnesium oxide, didn't do anything to my magnesium level. Oh, so you were actually so, testing your blood hmm. to see if it... Yeah, I tested uh, my minerals and things like that. So, so you could formulate uh, a ketone supplement that would be a great... <laughs> supplement to the ketogenic diet if you're or a low carb diet so if mm-hmm. you're doing a low carb diet but not not hitting ketone levels uh to a point where they would be kind of ergogenic in a way you can supplement with ketones and still get the benefit of low carb diet mm-hmm. and ketone supplement i'm now, also reading a lot of people online talking about a nootropic effect from mm-hmm. uh supplementing with well okay so it's been around for a long time now where you hear people saying Oh my God, I went, you know, I started eating ketogenic and I can think clearer. I, I feel mm-hmm. sharper. So you've got all these brain hackers who eat. Do you think it's diets. from the keto, the ketones, or you think it's because of the suppressing the carbohydrates? Which one do you think it's? Uh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. So if you're putting in energy or calories in the form of ketones, well, people need to recognize that if they're consuming these ketone supplements, it is a source of calories, mm-hmm. even though. The FDA doesn't really have it, you know, it's not in the food label. It doesn't say it. You know, when you buy them, you're like, oh, there's no calories in this. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And I think marketers try to play that up. But yeah, you are consuming calories and you'd be, uh, your appetite might go down because you're consuming, you know, calories, Mm -hmm. right? Your your body has kind of energy sensors. Uh, So the neurological effects could be due to a number of different factors. Like I said, uh, Stephen Cunane in Cal- in, uh, in Canada, he does a dual PET scan. I talked about a glucose PET scan, an FDG PET scan. Well, he does a ketone PET scan. So he can image the brain and the fluorescent intensity of the signal reflects brain ketone utilization. And he can do a glucose and a ketone PET scan and show that the brain can use both fuels very efficiently. As we age, we have impaired glucose metabolism as we age, but that's not the case for ketones. So our ability to use ketones as brain fuel does not change as we age as it does with mm. glucose. So I think the the people that maybe, you know, benefit from this most are the age population or people with some kind of impairment or the special operations community or if we're see so a lot of what I do is studying the physiology and the neuroscience of extreme environments whether that be like altitude or space or the hyperbaric environment the um the in that case ketones shine they seem to shine because they can uh, suppress oxidative stress and they preserve brain energy metabolism and function even in the face of an oxidative challenge or an extreme environment. Uh, but when it comes to a normal healthy person, I think the the jury's still out as to whether it's beneficial. There's anecdotal reports out there and I can even say myself, I notice it if I'm a little bit hungry during the middle of the day or something and I've fasted quite a bit and I take ketone supplements without a doubt. I mean, my energy, I'm more focused. I can kind of work more productive. So it may just be that their brains weren't just working very well with with glucose. And so now on the ketogenic diet, it works well. They've got good energy yep. and they feel a boost, but not necessarily because it's a boost on its own. Yep. And there's, there's other, you know, as a scientist, I have to critique even these anecdotal reports and even myself. So if I was to give an equal amount of sodium and fluids and it increases my blood volume, I get better circulation to the brain and, you know, even a little boost to my sympathetic nervous system Mm -hmm. when you, when you get a little bit of sodium and fluids in you, and then that could be stimulating, you Mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. Uh, So you have to tease out all these effects. I'm glad you said that because this is the thing that always worries me when I'm hearing us talk about this right now is we get this little bit of science and good information that we're learning. Now all of a sudden the market takes it and, and I can argue or I could pitch that, if this supplement, uh, it could help increase stamina and like, you know, endurance type runners that it could help you build muscle because now you could go longer and go harder and increase volume. So yeah. now I can sell it as like a muscle building supplement or even possibly a fat burning supplement when yeah. really it's like splitting hairs on how much it's really beneficial, especially if all the other shit in your life's all fucked up. Like you're not yeah, drinking yeah. enough water, your sodium's <laughs> off, your macros are all fucked up. Yeah, but yeah. now you're buying this $50 supplement because you think it's going to help you burn fat or build muscle. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why we really need the studies and we harp on that all the time. Uh, In regards to building muscle, there is some data to show that ketones can be anabolic in some ways. Oh, that's Uh, a big one. Yeah. yeah. What what is it showing? What is the science showing? uh, Well, uh, it it depends. There was a study in humans actually where they gave like IV ketones and looked at uh, leucine metabolism and protein synthesis and showed that it went up 
in the presence of an you know IV administration of sodium beta hydroxybutyrate. And there was a couple studies in animal models, one in a, an animal model of muscular dystrophy that showed that acetoacetate, which breaks down from beta hydroxybutyrate, and we, we can also, we develop forms of acetoacetate. And we think it's important to get a ratio of acetoacetate to beta hydroxybutyrate in the blood to get mm-hmm. optimal effects. That acetoacetate has, uh, can mitigate the, the muscle loss and even uh, aid in, in muscle regeneration in particular disease models. Um, and it's a, it was, a some preliminary reports on, on, on animal models showing that. So that's something that we want to study. Actually, uh, Andrew Kutnick, the PhD student in, in the lab, uh, is, you know, focusing on mitigating cancer muscle wasting called cancer cachexia. And we are developing a, a mitigation strategy to prevent that. And, and from an evolutionary perspective, if we're fasting, um, our body will shift over from using glucose to fatty acids and ketones for mm. fuel. Uh, the brain does not readily uh, get fatty, long-chain fatty acids as a source of energy. So if we didn't make ketones, we would catabolize, we would break down a lot of the gluconeogenic amino acids from our body, namely our skeletal muscle, right? Because that's the biggest source of it. Mm-hmm. So we would start chopping up all these amino acids uh, to main, the body has very, very powerful homeostatic mechanisms to main blood glucose. So it will chew up all your muscle to keep blood glucose mm-hmm. to send energy to the brain. Uh, what prevents that is the formation of ketones in the liver. So if the ketones are elevated in the blood, then they become extremely anti catabolic. And that's the evolutionary, you know, one of the main purposes is to supply. Your your brain is like three percent of your body weight, but it sucks up twenty to in some cases twenty five and thirty percent of your energy. So it's a massive energy sink, and your body will do everything in its power to prevent it from being energy deprived. So if you have ketones elevated, that's a tremendous buffer from catabolizing, you know, uh, amino acids from your muscle. So they're they're very anti catabolic in that sense. Wow. So let's talk about current research right now. What are you, are you able to talk about what you're working on now? Cause I know mm-hmm. a lot of the stuff you do in the past, you've worked with the military, with mm-hmm. the Navy SEALs. Yeah, I'd love to talk about what you're doing with, with NASA. Yeah. Yeah. Can you go possible. into some of that? Yeah. Uh, so we have, I would say, you know, a half dozen or more different kind of like active projects. Uh, the big one that kicked everything off was oxygen toxicity seizures. And uh, that was done in uh, a Sprague Dolly rat model where we just, can, you know, gave ketone esters and looked at the effects of, of mitigating oxygen toxicity seizures. And that work has recently translated to uh, projects that we're writing up and working on getting funding for because uh, the agency supports it. It's Office of Navy Research and NAVC. It's part of the Department of Defense to do an, an analogous study in humans where they are in a hyperbaric chamber and they are exercising uh, at a level of hyperbaric oxygen that would be equivalent to you know various uh, missions using a closed circuit rebreather and looking at uh, oxygen toxicity and actually taking these guys to seizures. Or they, wow. they actually... Wow have physiological biomarkers with that they can detect that are early indicators that you're going to have a seizure. Interesting. And, uh, and then so they, they have, can predict it like, okay, this guy's about to have a seizure. Yeah. Wow. So they, they focus on that, but they also have guys, uh, so they're underwater sort of exercising, but with their head above water to catch them so they don't get. So these are experiments that are kind of being, uh, are in the process now of, of getting funding uh, and will be done at, at Duke University in collaboration with with our lab. So it's a it's a translation of our preclinical animal work to the human populations, which we've been working for, working on. And, and some of the more potent ketone supplements are not yet FDA approved. So we actually, we're going to use the ketogenic diet because when I first got into this, there was such a stigma on the ketogenic diet killing athletic performance that the Navy didn't even uh, want to touch it. Sure. But now, as some of the data is emerging, it's showing that, well, it may not be so detrimental to performance. It actually may be helpful. So they kind of warmed up to the idea of using a modified Atkins diet uh, to produce ketones in addition 
to some commercially available ketone supplements that can be formulated and to put these guys on and, and to do the study. So, so oxygen toxicity uh, is one and also uh, exercise performance. So warfighter performance uh, is, is a big one. And mm. that's our program officer is actually the program officer for undersea medicine and also like warfighter performance. So he's interested in, um, you know, basically finding out what's the optimal ketone supplement, what's the optimal, you know, nutritional ketosis state that can optimize performance under a range of environmental extremes, mm -hmm. whether it be hypoxia to hyperoxia to, uh, you know, even hyperthermia, you know, or hypothermia has been a topic of one of the recent meetings. Yeah, we the, is there any benefit to eating ketogenic when you're in those those extreme temperatures? Uh, well, the animal, some of the animal data suggests that when your body, you know, is adapted to uh, a ketogenic diet, you may have some better thermo tolerance in, in under both extremes. Interesting. But it has not been tested experimentally yet in like a controlled trials in humans. So these are things that we're moving towards. And uh, is there any anecdote out there, any chatter? Because I think there's a, there's a lot of these extreme athletes that are doing these like cold dips and, yeah. <laughs> you know, cold and hot contrast. Is anybody mm. saying like, hey, ketogenic diet helps me with that, you know? Uh, I haven't paid attention, so I don't know. So I'm it, just curious. Yeah, there's, there's, you do get a thermogenic effect from certain types of fatty acids. Even medium chain triglycerides mm -hmm. can stimulate thermogenesis in some ways, uh, but nothing really, you know, robust. It's all like a very little effect. Uh, we just had a meeting on hypothermia and how to mitigate it, and kind of the best things out there from the literature was like caffeine, ephedrine. <laughs> uh, stack. Yeah. It was like vasoconstrictors. Like, uh, yeah. And just, uh, just stimulating, you know, m metabolism mm. in, in Catecholamine general. production. Uh, yeah. And just, just internal, you know, oxygen consumption. And then, but if you, when you're stimulating metabolism, it's a double edged sword because you are consuming more oxygen too. Mm. So you increase oxygen consumption, which is not a great thing in some situations. And, Central nervous system stimulants can make you more susceptible to CNS oxygen toxicity. Mm. So, oh, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, like if you take a big hit of a stimulant, right? <laughs> uh, well, we did a study. It was funded by Divers Alert Network using pseudoephedrine, uh, racemic ephedrine, and it, the dose had to be high. But if you're if the dose was if you downed about you know four or five times the recommended dose, <laughs> and you went and you went diving, you could have a seizure. Uh, faster uh, within, but uh, and people do abuse, you know, uh, ephedrine in that way. And divers, uh, the worst thing for a diver is to have sinus congestion, and you want your eustachian tubes and your sinuses oh, cleared so out. So they must use pseudoephedrine so, like crazy. Yeah, when we went, so I'm a diver, and when we would do, when we would be diving, like everybody would, you know, hand around their package of pseudoephedrine, and people would pop pseudoephedrine before getting in the water wow. because they don't want. Uh, you could pop your eardrums if your eustachian tubes are clogged. So it's very common to take these decongestants when you dive, and they are CNS stimulants. You know, like ephedrine, mm -hmm. it's a pretty powerful stimulant. That's fascinating. And, so if you take pseudoephedrine and you're going diving, it's probably a good idea to be on a ketogenic diet or take some ketones, kind yeah. of offset that. Yep. To yep. offset that whole situation. Yep. So something pops up in my head when we talk about uh, supplementing with ketones and exogenous ketones. Uh, do we see um, individual variances when people go on ketogenic diets in terms of the types and amounts of ketones that they're producing? Because there's, there's different ketones that people run off of, right? And mm -hmm. I, I would imagine that one of the difficulties in creating a supplement would be to kind of hit what the body would naturally produce or what the, you know, because you've got beta hydroxybutyrate and you've got some other stuff going on. What, what do, do we see individual variances where this person's key in ketosis, but we see higher levels of these ketones and, you know, this is going on with him and this person over here is a little different or is it more general? Yeah. Than that? So, um, to answer your question, yeah, there is big variation. So <laughs> I guess the important thing from a practical perspective is how do we use, different tools to figure out, you know, if we are making ketones well or, or how to optimize it for us personally. And I think that's what we're really interested in, in doing that. And we also know that uh, the body has about a dozen different ket ketogenic enzymes, you know, uh, one is uh, thiolase and one is HMG-CoA lyase. And these enzyme activities vary in, in different people and will be... Uh, 
very important for their adaptation to a ketogenic diet. And in some ways, you can upregulate the enzymes over time. Uh, but I think the best indicator is kind of like your performance and how you feel, but uh, also the measurement of urine uh, ketones, which would be acetoacetate or mm. blood beta hydroxybutyrate, which can be measured by a commercial meter mm -hmm. in Abbott's lab, Precision Extra or, uh, or Neo. And if you are just feeling, typically if you feel good on a ketogenic diet, and I would basically just stop what I'm doing if I felt really good and then check my ketones and I consistently, uh, instead of checking my ketones and trying to like, you know, saying, okay, I feel good because my ketones are high. I would kind of stop when I felt most energetic and most lucid and I consistently got a certain ketone range. And I would tell people to do the same thing, follow a ketogenic diet. And if you feel like crap, well, measure your glucose and ketones at that point in time. And that's probably areas where you don't want to be in. Whereas yeah. When you feel most energetic, have the best stamina, try to get a try to get a, a metabolic snapshot of what that is, and try to figure out what you did and how to achieve that state, um, and and those biomarkers that made you achieve that physiological psychological now, state. Now so I know for a lot of people, when they reduce carbohydrates and bump up fats, and even if they do ketogenic or modified keto, you tend to see the literature at least shows that you see lots of improvements in blood markers like cholesterol and triglycerides and better insulin sensitivity. However, there are cases where um, you've got, you, you'll put people on a ketogenic diet and their lipids just go crazy and it just doesn't look good. Um, what, why is that? And are these people obviously should not eat, you know, a higher fat diet or is it the type mm -hmm. of fats that they're eating that they may need to change? Well, I had that too. I got an NMR lipid profile, which mm. looked at everything and my LDLP uh, was elevated. My LDL was elevated. So like really high. Um, uh, and that's not the case anymore. Uh, but when I, when I did that test, I was eating about 60% of my fat intake was dairy fat. Mm. And over the course now, maybe about 10 or 15% is dairy fat. And I was just showing Andrew my numbers yesterday. Uh, my total cholesterol, it was 300 and now it's 180. And my triglycerides are like 50 or 60 or something like that. Mm. And uh, just by dropping down the dairy, the dairy fat and adding more monounsaturated fat. So the composition of the fat and uh, plays a big role and also maybe adaptation too. So I purposely, I did that pricey lipid profile test, which my insurance didn't cover. So I took a big hit to my pocket. <laughs> but, so it was like $1,500 test. Is but this it, the one uh, where you look at like the size of the LDL particles yeah, and the whole thing? Okay. Yeah. And there was like lots of red flags there. Really? Uh, hmm. And I followed it for, you know, I, I consistently ate uh, what I The experiment was it, like eating my keto mousse, which was like basically a quart of sour cream a day. So I was getting like 250 grams of <laughs> Sounds fat. Sounds fucking awesome. Mm. Dry, it, you know, and my weight didn't even really go up that much. Uh, but, which is interesting because I, I am a good fat oxidizer, but no other biomarker or what I consider a biomarker of general health was elevated. My C-reactive protein was like uh, 0 0.1 in a range. So everything yeah. else was great. Everything. Uh, my triglycerides were even pretty good. Uh, they bumped up a little bit to maybe 65 or 70, but on a general scale that that was really good. My glucose was good. Uh, every other, my blood pressure, heart, like all, all other things that I think, think are most important biomarkers of health were excellent. So what you know, and I talked to the experts that are leading lipidologists on this. And they said, oh, yeah, that's, you know, that's, these are numbers that you want to bring down. But then I questioned them, everything that we know about, you know, LDL and LDL, you know, little p particle size and things like that, we understand it in the context of a regular diet. We do not understand what these numbers mean in the context of a ketogenic diet, wow, which that's is a great point. radically different than the eating pattern of a normal diet. Because that same so, number could be horrible. Or what, do, yeah, what do they say to you normal. when you say that? Do they do they respond? What do they respond to you? They say that's a that's a really good point, and uh, and they say you know well well you have to ask the question of why why is it elevated, and I think 
You know, the LDL particle are like little boats that carry around cholesterol and even triglycerides. And if you're eating, if you're pounding tons of fat, which you do, you know, on especially a classical occasion, you're going to need more little boats in there to carry around <laughs> the fat. So I think it's the body's way to just upregulate uh, a transport mechanism for fat and cholesterol mm -hmm. and, and things that you're eating. So, uh, and I think there's more maybe turnover too. I think your adipose tissue kind of opens up where you have more fats coming in and being stored, but you have more fats going out and being, so there's just like more rapid turnover of triglyceride in the adipose and probably in the liver and other intra-organ kind of uh, movement of fatty acids too, as you adapt to it. Um, so I, I think that's the reason, but we don't know. I mean, classically though, those markers are correlated with- And that's why you change your diet because you're like, well, we don't know, but I want to make sure. Yep, yep, we don't know. And I, uh, I basically, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what is, people ask like, what should my fat ratio be? If you were to, you know, take a biopsy of someone's adipose and look at the primary fat, which, in, which is in the adipose, it would be monounsaturated fat. So uh, I think from a very simplistic point of view, it would make sense to kind of eat the types of fats that our body prefers to store as an energy source for mm. use of energy source. So uh, a lot of people think like a, a steak is like pure saturated fat, but if you look at a steak, it's it's mostly monounsaturated. Especially fat, if it's actually. grass fed, you see a different yeah, little bit of it, a different fatty acid profile. Is, yep, that changes it too. Um, <clears throat> and I actually I was talking to this uh, a few years ago uh, with Donald Lehman, who is a uh, uh, Eric or uh, Lane Norton's a PhD advisor on fatty acid composition of different protein sources and he was like it was his impression that a steak is actually perfect you know mm. kind of a a, a fat source and, hell and yeah we, we were <laughs> i love about, this yeah. you just made my day yeah the, yeah, the talk was ba basically about and this was goes back years ago about the um the demonization of saturated fat and mm -hmm. and uh and and what what types of fats would be ideal for, for well, I also so, think it's interesting that when you look at cholesterol n numbers, y very, very high cholesterol is correlated with early death, but it's also correlated with longevity. Some of the long, like the oldest people. Yeah, how worthless yeah, are yeah. The, the basic cholesterol studies? I mean, a, a test that a doctor gives you nowadays, is it worthless now uh, from what we know now? Uh, 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 yeah, I definitely, I mean, it's much more important to focus on your triglycerides. If your triglycerides are elevated, that basically means that your, your fat metabolism sucks. Mm -hmm. So if you have all these fats floating around, they have the potential to be oxidized and wreak havoc on different things. But uh, I think, you know, your triglyceride number, that tells a story. And the fastest way to lower your triglycerides is to eliminate uh, or reduce carbohydrates. Yep. Because if mm. you have sugar and glucose in your blood and your body's not, your body's not going to suck up the, the triglycerides mm -hmm. and, and use that for fuel if it has glucose. So mm. there's the kind mm. of a competition there. So if you lower glucose, that forces your body to uh, dispose of essentially the triglycerides that are floating around in your system and to oxidize those as fuel. I always, I always found it fascinating with cholesterol. There was, a, there was a little stint there where I did a lot of research and reading myself on the internet. Um, and it was crazy because I found people who had relatively or by current standards high cholesterol, so over, the, over 200, that's like the people who are like the centurions. They all tend to have this kind of higher cholesterol or yeah. at least those that do get less infections are stronger, have more mobility. And then LDL, although high LDL was, was connected to heart disease, it was also connected to a uh, stronger immune system. Like people didn't get infections uh, as often with high LDL. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize that low cholesterol, like really no, low numbers, are strongly connected to uh, mental, uh, you know, issues mm -hmm. like depression. Yeah. You and know, like so it's an interesting <laughs> all cause mortality. Too. All cause. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, cholesterol is an essential building block. Your brain is like a big chunk of cholesterol, fat and cholesterol and phospholipids. So it would make sense that, uh, it would make real sense that if you're deficient in cholesterol, that could be a, a very serious thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when it's high, that's, I'm not convinced that that's, that's a bad thing. Uh, if your LDL is high, mm -hmm. uh, it's good to have your HDL elevated to uh, pretty, I, I'm pretty convinced that low HDL uh, can contribute to, to heart attacks. Just seeing some of the numbers out there, um, there's various things like uh, anabolics can really push your HDL down into like even the single digits sometimes. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, I think it's really important to keep your a healthy HDL uh, level to like 60, 70, 80, mm -hmm. even 100. <laughs> What, 
Well, so uh, who are the kind of people that you would say you could say right now that probably shouldn't eat a ketogenic type diet? Are, are there any is there any kinds of people that you'd say, OK, look, I don't think I'd recommend this to you. Or is it more of a try it first and then determine? I would say all kids and teens and maybe even early 20s that don't have a problem, uh, you know, uh, are not overtly obese or insulin resistant could probably do fine just on a, on a, hmm. a you know a higher carbohydrate diet but uh, I think you know generally people who have uh, who feel like they have a preoccupation with food too and they have to eat a lot and they're always hungry so I have people who come up to me and it's like oh, I gotta eat all the time I got and you know and it's kind of liberating to eat a diet that's higher in, in fat and protein and not be hungry all the time. Mm -hmm. So if that's uh, something that I think appeals to them, then which, you know, should appeal to people who don't want to be kind of hungry all the time, I think. I think, <laughs> right. I think they should at least give it a try. So Dom, I want to I want to pivot a little bit because if I let Sal, we will talk about studies <clears throat> for four hours here. For Damn sure. it. <laughs> and I always like to give we'll our audience a, a little more of, you know, your personal background and maybe your business mind and sense. And, uh, you know, tell me, like, I have no idea, like, how does a scientist get paid? How do you, how do you make a living being yeah. a scientist? Cause if I feel like, uh, there's not a, a lot of ways you guys, how do you guys yeah. do that? Like, how's it work? It's not easy. Yeah, how do you monetize? Yeah. It's not, oh, to monetize. Yeah. So we get a, a modest salary, you know, as an educator. Well, I guess I'll take a step back. So as a PhD student, uh, well, I'm extremely fortunate. The last you know, two PhD students in my lab, uh, Nathan Ward and, and Andrew Kutnick, are presidential fellows uh, from our university, which is a very prestigious award that you get, you know, as a fellow. And basically, you have a full ride. So, and that as a principal investigator running a lab, the biggest hit to your budget is actually when you take on a PhD student to do research in the lab, and they re really are kind of steering the wheel, they're in the trenches. You have to pay their stipend, uh, which is like twenty-five to twenty-seven thousand dollars a year. You have to pay their uh, tuition. You have to pay their health insurance. It ends up being like forty, you know, forty-five thousand uh, in the business world. That's that's not much, but mm -hmm. to a scientist, if you have multiple students, that that ends up being a lot. So we have to get that money from federal grants, or or if we're lucky enough, grants from industry. Uh, so as a student, you know, I was funded from a a fellowship too, but it was a fellowship through, um, not a presidential fellowship, but uh, one through my my advisor. And it's a very modest income, just enough to live on, basically like mm -hmm. 25, 30,000. And then as a postdoc, you get bumped up to maybe after you finish kind of like analogous to a residency, if you do your MD, you're getting paid maybe about 40 to 45,000. Mm -hmm. And that money, uh, you start after your PhD, you work as a postdoctoral fellow and your that period is your period to shine and to establish yourself as an indiv independent investigator. So you pick a project and you just keep writing grants and writing grants until you get funding to fund your own salary. Uh, and it's kind of sounds know, daunting. 12, 16 hour days of research. Not only in the lab are you doing research and running your own experiments, but you are. Uh, your PI typically has a little bit of money to get you started, but basically says, you know, go do the research and and write grants to get your own funding because I don't want to keep having to fund you, you know, all the time. And if you move on and then get, you know, I was lucky enough to get funding through uh, the Office of Navy Research um, to do it. I had submitted grants to many different agencies, American Lung Association, American Heart Association, even NIH, and they all got rejected. Uh, wow. But then I, I wrote a proposal to do something that was really high risk but high reward, and it was to, to develop uh, hyperbaric atomic force microscopy, which is a type of microscopy that allows you to like zoom in on cells and get ultra high resolution scans, like in a like an electron microscope, but you could do it on living tissue. And it was kind of like an out of the box. And we were going to take this technology and instead of using it on like Silicon Valley applications like materials, we were going to like image living cells with it. And then not only that, we were going to take this technology and stick it inside a hyperbaric chamber that could simulate all sorts of environmental conditions, whether it be the you know top of a mountain or uh, the undersea environment. Now, are you watching mainly. the cells real time with this? 
Yeah, so you can wow. you can image cells real time. The tip uh, with an atomic force microscope, the tip uh, actually in interacts with the sample, so you can like functionalize the tip. You can push in on the membrane and do see what's going know, on membrane wow. viscoelastic changes and. And uh, so m with my postdoctoral fellowship, I just, I tended, I, I did something, uh, I got funding to do a pretty uh, novel project. And that was a stepping stone uh, to, to other grants and to work with other investigators who wanted to use this, this kind of technology. Um, and then, you know, working with the Office of Navy Research, uh, because they funded the project, they're more likely to fund you to use the tool that you developed. You know, so that led to another, a larger grant, which led to a larger grant and a larger grant. And then I moved from a postdoc to what's called a research assistant professor, but on soft money, which means the university was not paying me. I was paying all my salary and paying even the people under me and paying for Through all my the experiments. Grants. Yeah. So completely soft money, and uh, and then God, I hit, it sounds like a pain in the ass, dude. Yeah, you're always like on edge because if you lose your funding, you know, they like kick you out. Like so do. so nobody you, goes you, into this to become rich. Basically, you, you've been in the <laughs> yeah. game for a long time, and you then. can't. Your salary set, like you, you know, the school basically says, well, you can pay yourself hmm. that amount, and it's just enough. You know, you can't. You really get supplemental income, but then I transitioned into what was called a tenure track position, and you get five years. To be, and in that five years, if you do, if you publish X amount of papers, if you pull in X amount of research dollars, typically in the millions they want, if you uh, teach X amount of classes and serve on, you know, the, you know, X amount of uh, committees, you know, service to, and there's this metric that you have to hit, and if you hit all that within a, a five-year time frame, and that time frame does seem very compressed, uh, what all you get. They, you can get promoted to tenure. And I recently got that like last year. So in that tenure, what that tenure does is they basically, the school uh, covers your salary up to 50 to 70% of your salary. And then you have to pay the rest of it through grants, but it secures your position at the school where you have to do something mm -hmm. illegal for them to like fire you sure, or something sure, yeah. completely out of line. So that was kind of a, that's that's like a big that's like kind of the, the thing that people going in academia as a scientist try to do. They try to get into a tenure track position and hope that all goes well. And then when you come up for tenure, you have to submit this huge packet of information that are a committee who evaluates you. It's no you. joke, man. And it's, yeah. how, many, no joke. how many is times? Any this, yeah, is any of this like intellectual property that you can keep for yourself or do you have to uh, good question. Yeah, sort of <laughs> give this away to the people giving you grants? Uh, that's a really good question. So depending on the agency that's funding you, if it's a company or an industry, the contract may say in the contract that they have all the rights to the intellectual property. God, and the Department of Defense, surprisingly, uh, kind of gives up all the intellectual property oh, from, from to, to the university. Mm. So I can be an, an inventor, which we do have a number of patents, like almost up to 10 patents now. Uh, and not all of them are licensed, just some of them are. But the school essentially owns that intellectual property. You are an inventor on it. And then they have their technology transfer team works with all the interested parties and they basically negotiate, you know, who's going to get the license for what kind of application It's very different, you know, different if it's going to be a medical application, a military application, or like a general sort of use, use one of those. yeah, general pop, you know, kind of Does use. Does doing stuff like this help, uh, like getting on podcasts and cause you've been on the circuit now, I've, I've heard you talk, I've seen you talk on YouTube, uh, uh, Ted talks and you know, you go on a lot of podcasts. Does that help to, to do that kind of stuff to be able to get, you know, because now you're known, like, is that more likely to get you more funding? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And I, I thank you guys mm. for giving me this platform and with all the reach that you have, it, it helps tremendously. Uh, and all the, you know, the different podcasts that we did, I think the, you know, the first one goes way back to like Mercola, who's kind of controversial. Oh. And, then, and then people reached out, mm. you know, were like, that that's like the kiss of death. You know, that's academic <laughs> suicide. Getting, and I didn't even know who he was. Like at the yeah. time when he contacted me years ago, I was like, yeah, sure. I'll, you want to hear? I was like honored. I was like, yeah, you want me to talk about our mm -hmm. research? So I did. And then my inbox like exploded and I didn't realize that, you know, the reach he had. And then it was, you know, 
lots of people you guys know, Ben Greenfield and Tim Ferriss, yeah. and, mm-hmm. and I think I did a little over 100 podcasts at this point in a TED Talk. And, and that, that uh, does give your research much more visibility, kind of puts the pressure on you too. And, uh, and I think, you know, maybe that's the future of science and scientists are kind of, yeah, uh, a I'm lot thinking. of kind of introverted <laughs> in many ways and, and will stay in their little silo shelter of a lab mm-hmm. and just publish, you know, mechanistic papers on this particular kinase or phosphatase. And it doesn't really have a whole lot of relevance, but, and Andrew, you know, my, my student and I were, were talking about this. We're really lucky to be doing research that the public at least perceives as things that's very translatable. And when it comes to diet, there's like so much, uh, you know, public interest in diet and people get very emotional about it and it hits them mm. like at the core, yeah. you know, if you're promoting a diet because that empowers them, it's not some weird esoteric pathway that you can develop a drug for that they can't really relate to. I mean, this is like uh, not just macronutrient ratios, but specific types of foods and supplements and things that they can use to empower themselves to treat a disease or enhance their performance or whatever. And that's Mm -hmm. pretty exciting uh, because I was in a pharmacology department. And when I started doing this high fat diet research, I saw some people like raising their eyebrows at me and just saying, you know, you just entered a tenure track position and you're trying to go, you're going to get tenure trying to do research on a high fat diet. You know, they thought it was like the academic kiss of death, you know, academic suicide. But, uh, but I kind of knew intuitively if you're doing research that people are interested in and it serves the public like in some way like the information and research you're putting out there it's going to come back to you like even if the government agencies are not funding this kind of research like if you're putting out good stuff like it's just going to come back to you you're going to we're going to stay afloat one way or another dom you know? do you do you ever do you ever have that fuck it i I just, instead of chasing all these grants and get, I mean, I feel like you got to connect a little bit with Navy SEALs, like all this hard behind the Mm -hmm. scenes work that nobody really glorifies at all. Nobody ever hears about or knows, right? Like, is there other, do you have moments in your career where you were like, you know what, I'm I'm done. I'm gonna go make some money. And that's all because a guy with your level of intelligence, I feel like could do almost anything he really wants. Circles around. Yeah. And make a ton of money. Uh, Do you battle with that ever? Yeah. well, also the thing that, you know, would make me marketable or to make money is the 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 science, you know. So I am I'm really passionate yep. about developing cuz I believe in what we're doing cuz we see it in the lab and I feel like we're just at the cusp of mm-hmm. this and maybe if I was like you know, in my, you know, 10 years from now, like in my mid fifties or something. And, you know, I would have a different perspective, but right now I feel like we put in so much time and effort just to get this thing rolling Mm. in many different directions. And, you know, we have students that are, you know, in the lab and things too, and they, they're working on projects, but, uh, but I feel, you know, the science still needs to get out there, but when it comes to make it, yeah, a university setting can be very stifling. And in many ways, because there's a massive amount of paperwork and I spend 70 percent, maybe 80 percent of my time just doing paperwork, Mm -hmm. writing grants and things like that and not connecting with my students and not kind of in the trenches, you know, you know, drawing blood or measuring this like in the lab where when you're a postdoc, I spent 90, you know, 5 percent of my time or 90 percent of my time just sitting at the bench, like running experiments and doing like crazy kind of science stuff. And now it's just like a lot of paperwork because it's not just the science and I got to do, you know, teaching and I got to do committee mm-hmm. service and, uh, and all this other it, stuff. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't seem to be super conducive to the creative process, uh, you know, to be uh, yeah, in that environment. Good, well, I know, like, you know, different scientists like, uh, Otto Warburg or even like Hans Krebs, if you guys know the Krebs cycle, like they're in their institutions, they actually freed them up. Like in the old day, if you were kind of a productive scientist, they would, pull all other obligations away from you and the university or institution would give you money and just kind of put you in the corner, like go do good stuff and report back to us. be free. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Be free. That's awesome. That's like, that's a dream. Nowadays, I guess if, you know, some donor, you know, donates and and says, we really like what you're doing and Mm. we think that, you know, maybe if we can give you some some money, of course, you know, there would be like benchmarks, you know, and every... Mm -hmm every quarter report back to us on, on your findings and things. And that's understandable. And like the department of defense does that. You have to give like technical reports if they, do they give you more freedom than the universities do? 
Uh, yeah, they do. Uh, I would imagine because they're they, like, they, they they're do. looking at the military and they're like, look, we need to figure yeah. this shit out now before, yeah. you know. Yeah, I think you get more latitude, there, right? Yeah. There's, yeah, you, when you get funding from them, you have to write up technical reports. I think if it's, if you're DARPA funded, which is, you, you got to do it like every month or like every quarter. But for the Department of Defense, like in, uh, in May, I will go to the Office of Navy Research Undersea Medicine Annual Review where I got to step up on stage and present everything to the big wigs. And this is what I did this year. And, uh, you know, these are the projects that I want to do and that sort of thing. And then it's kind of a conversation. So you don't not only submit technical reports, you have to kind of present your stuff to, to the, uh, the organization. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, and, and that's, that's to be, that keeps you on, that keeps you in line too. Right. Cause if you didn't have these benchmarks, then you wouldn't be, have something to strive for and you could be, steering off in this direction or that direction. So Dom, do you that feel helps. like, um, because I, I got to imagine like when you're doing this type of research, you got to just be buried in it. You know, like you mentioned 16 hour days and just thinking about yeah. it probably nonstop. Like, do you find, uh, that you, do you have exercises that you do to kind of detach or do you have mm -hmm. things, uh, that you're interested in that, that, uh, grab or that, you know, kind of help separate, that part of your life for balance. I mean, yeah. I mean, my wife makes sure of that. Right. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's like, uh, when I got married, uh, a year or so ago, it was like, you know, my weekends are for play for downtime and things like that, unless it's something, some big conference that, you know, I could bring her to, but, uh, we have dogs and every night we try to kind of take the dogs out and, uh, run with them. And I try to get to the gym for me. I like motorcycles. So, like the ultimate downtime for me is to kind of get home and get on my motorcycle and go to the gym and then listen to music and the combination of like music, motorcycles, gym, heavyweights, mm. you know, meeting, talking, seeing some familiar faces and everything. That's like a huge dopamine kind of rush and dump and it just gets me back. It kind of resets my whole physiology and then, and whatever's on my mind, I could have the worst day like all day, but if I go to the gym and have a productive workout, like everything changes, like oh, everything's good. So, uh, yeah, I think we can all connect with that for but sure. But you seem like such a driven Absolutely. person that you could probably, probably just love what you're studying so much that yeah. if you don't check that, you'll just absorb yourself and exactly. everybody else disappears. And I think you guys can relate to that totally. too, oh, yeah. because yeah. you guys love what you do and, and what you do is awesome. And I could like, I'm kind of really envious, you know, you're, mm. you're feeding off of all these uh, people that you're bringing in and learning new things that you can apply to yourself and promote and disseminate the information out there. So, yeah, I mean, even my, my students will, will tell you, and I have to kind of tell them, you know, to back off. I was like, you know, you guys are working a little too hard there. You got you to gotta take some time off and enjoy things. But as scientists, one of the benefits that we have is that we present at conferences all over the world. So uh, we do have the opportunity to go and present at all, all these different places. And we always take a, a day or two out to do some sightseeing and have some fun doing that but you know no matter how busy it gets uh i always block out x amount of time you know at at the least it would be 30 minutes but usually more than that per day just in downtime you know awesome. talking about your peers and, and doing that like who are some of who are some of your favorite humans that you've met and that you've got to mingle with and, besides us or yeah, besides <laughs> us uh as, and research wise or whatever yet. like that you've came across i mean yeah. Wow. There's so many of them that I consider like mentors and good friends now. Um, like, yeah, people that had really big info from my PhD advisor, uh, who, uh, was pretty inspirational. Dr. Uh, J Dean, who basically developed this idea of doing science inside these hyperbaric chambers and building microscopes and electrophysiology equipment inside these hyperbaric chambers to simulate. And nobody else in the world was doing that. Uh, more recently, you know, I, I have a position at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, and that's run by uh, Dr. Kent Ford, who uh, he found me because he he was actually doing the ketogenic diet for like a decade, and he was a former executive uh, director person at NASA and developed his own institute, which is uh, – really about building kind of humanoid robots, like the stuff, like a Terminator type things. Right. And he got, I think their institute got second place in the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Uh, but his institute is two things. It's human and machine cognition. So Ooh, wow. it's developing robotic, developing different 
uh, artificial intelligence uh, kind of projects and and humanoid robots to uh, basically understanding the science and the physiology of extreme environments. So it's part of its like uh, engineering uh, artificial intelligence, and the other part is understanding the physiological limitations of these extreme environments and developing research programs to develop countermeasures, even ketones as a countermeasure to enhance performance in extreme environments. And a lot of it's NASA based, based things. Uh, and I've met, you know, some really fascinating people uh, that have worked with Ken, including Michael Gernhart, who's been up on the space station uh, many times and a played a big role in doing the EVAs and, and developing various technologies that are up on the space station now. He's an astronaut. He was also, with Ken, he was the principal investigator of the lunar rover, the Mars rover mm-hmm. project. And actually, uh, when I was at NASA, Johnson Space Center, he gave me a complete tour of everything, including the neutral buoyancy lab, where they had the mock-up of the space station is underwater. And he took me to the... Uh, the rover and let me drive it out on the lawn. Oh, and I was yeah. able, you know, doing like burnouts and skis. Yeah. <laughs> the rover. That's awesome. So that, that was really cool. So Most these expensive are... RC vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Figure eights. That's so awesome. it was a pretty big vehicle. It's like, uh, you know, we had three of us in there when we were driving it around and it's one joystick. And oh, right. go around. It can spin on a dime and it was really cool. So these are the kind of people that I never thought getting into this path of research would bring me in touch with these these guys that are really icons in, in the field and icons in what they do. Uh, and they've been mentors to me in many ways. And, and working with uh, uh, the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, uh, my former, uh, or my a good friend of mine, Don Kernegas, who, who is also a full-time employee there, uh, just served on the NASA NEMO 21 mission, which is an Earth-based space analog down in the Keys, And it's basically a laboratory underwater where you test out different technologies uh, that are tracked for the International Space Station and Orion or uh, the basically what will be the mission to Mars. And uh, and so know, cool. And that's yeah. happening, right? That, that, I mean, didn't NASA just say like, we are going to go to Mars? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that the public might not know about that need to be done, <laughs> you know, in, in, in analogs here on earth. And it's testing different technologies, whether it be, um, you know, testing different foods or different, you know, drills or basically, you know, a whole range, like dozens of technologies was, they were uh, uh, studied on the NASA mm-hmm. NEMO 21 mission. And uh, actually just recently, you know, our lab has, uh, w- you know, under the umbrella of IHMC, will be contributing to the NASA uh, NEMO 22 mission, mm-hmm. which will test uh, nutritional ketosis. Uh, and we'll look at things like body composition, heart rate variability. We'll look at gut microbiome. We're going to look at metabolomics, uh, you know, basically getting a snapshot of how our metabolism changes in that extreme environment and how ketones can help mitigate some of the it, some of the effects. It looks like a lot of money is going into mm. using ketogenic diet or ketones to mitigate uh, potential like damage, like acute or long term type damage to the brain in the body, extreme environments or mm-hmm. oxygen, you know, hyper oxygenation or too little oxygen or concussion or all these different scenarios where, you know, uh, you you can cause some serious damage to your body. It looks like there's a lot of money going into looking how ketones can help, help those situations. Is, is that, am I, am I being yeah. accurate? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, so it's, it sounds And even like, the heart too. So the heart wow. is probably... I think there's more data for the cardioprotective properties of ketones for the heart hmm. than equally or, or maybe even more so than the brain. And early work was done in the lab of uh, Richard Veach, who was uh, a student of uh, Hans Krebs mm-hmm. and the Krebs cycle. And he his lab demonstrated uh, an energetic efficiency of ketones in the heart where you develop Portionally, the, the hydraulic efficiency of the heart was increased about 25% uh, hydraulic efficiency of, of using ketones to burning ketones and burning glucose. Wow. Fuel. So if I'm listening to this and I'm a listener, I'm thinking to myself like, okay, 
next time I go party for the next three days and I don't get any sleep and I'm gonna do all this crazy stuff, I'm gonna eat a ketogenic diet to protect my brain from all this crazy stuff. Is that that sounds like a crazy leap, but uh, maybe not? Um, uh, I think the science is supporting that. So yeah. you know, well, there you go. I There's your say, advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> next time you go to Vegas, uh, yeah. Yeah. eat a ketogenic diet. We're gonna Man, we're gonna mar- we're gonna market that, bro. We're gonna sell yeah. that. I'll just say the Vegas trip. Party ketones. <laughs> if you're gonna go party with hookers <laughs> and coke, here's what I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe fasting too. So uh, oh, don't right? eat. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or maybe what, what I like to call uh, I call it like ketogenic. Supplemented ketogenic intermittent fasting. Well, they okay. so, yeah. mm. <laughs> they both so you're, have a lot fasting. of similar benefits, right? right. Like when you fasting. pair them side yeah. by side, the ketogenic diet and and intermittent fasting. I feel like yeah. th- that being said, we're all huge fans of. I mean, uh, I typically intermittent fast at least once a week. I just kind of throw it in my routine. Uh, how often do you do it? I know you've. I know you did your study where you did. I think what five days, and then you deadlifted like five hundred something pounds. I remember that. Uh, how often in your normal life, if you're not studying it, are you? Yeah, uh, it, it varies, but uh, typically once or twice a week, yeah. you know, with my normal routine, unless I'm like dev- like testing something, mm-hmm. you know, and sometimes it uh, like uh, on my honeymoon, I think where we went all through Southeast Asia, you know, I felt it was probably best to do a little bit of fasting. <laughs> uh, uh, I just very strategic. Like, I just yeah. came back from Cambodia. Thailand and was uh, be- oh. bedridden with uh, food, yeah. foodborne illness. So yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> we went through like Philippines, Cambodia, Malaysia, all that. My wife's a crazy travel person so uh yeah so i i fasted in some cases and brought <laughs> brought some uh some sardines on on days that I oh you still eat sardines for breakfast uh i do yeah see I do. all the smart people do adam not not every day but <laughs> okay. uh a lot of times when i'm traveling we do we, we that's had, this guy uh, over here for what, what do you see uh now for selling us on the sardines <laughs> where do you see with you know just to kind of uh end the episode on, I, I want people kind of look forward like where do you see future research on ketones like where where should we point our gaze is it okay yeah. to make speculations on where you think they're going to start looking at you know uh, how ketones can affect mm-hmm. the body well any any research that's being done on metabolism i think is fair game for ketone research because ketones are an energy metabolite that's superior in many ways to other fuels that our body can use so whether that be uh neuroscience cardiovascular uh, oh, one of the papers that we got out in Frontiers uh, Neuroscience was the effect of ketones on anxiety behavior. So, uh, Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, and uh, we were gavaging or we were giving a dose of ketones to rats before we were diving them and observed that they were just easier to handle, easier to, you know, they're just calm. They're re- really chill. So we realized that we weren't anesthetizing them because when we put them on like a treadmill device, they can run equal or farther, you know? So it wasn't like that we were sedating them. So it was actually, m- my wife had the idea, well, let's get the equipment to do like an elevated plus maze and do, do these anxiety kind of uh, measurements. And the data was really robust on that, showing that it attenuates fear behavior so with the type of experiment that we did, it's called an elevated plus maze, uh, the rats can go into a little cave or they can come out like on a catwalk where they basically, it's just like a, a platform where they could fall off the edge. Uh, they have to have, you know, an intuitive exploratory behavior and not be afraid of it. Uh, and there was much more time and you set up a camera to determine, to calculate all the time they're in the open arm versus the little cave or closed arm and how many times they go in and out. And there's all different ways to analyze it. But the bottom line was that the uh, the rats had less fear response and more exploratory behavior when they were in a state of nutritional ketosis. Wow. And that has, we think, implications. We just published that maybe uh, a month or two ago. And it has direct implications, we think, for guys with like PTSD mm. or, you know, brain mm. injury too, where it can kind of contribute to like fear, but mm. definitely PTSD. I want to see some anxiety studies. Disorders. I want to see some studies with ADD and ADHD. You yeah, because yep. I, I would assume. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, but I would assume there would be some effect. Uh, you know, maybe a positive effect. I know anecdotally, yeah. I've have. Uh, you know, I, I belong to fitness and nutrition forums, and you got parents on there like, "Oh man, when I have my kids eat more fat and really restrict their carbohydrates." And yeah. I don't know if it's just because they're eating less sugar or whatever, but their ADD gets much better. Yeah, and I get a steady stream of uh, parents that contact you do. me that, hmm. and they did it. Not even the kids, just getting their kids off sugar. 
and Ooh. replacing carbohydrates with fat and don't say and that protein. to Lane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> about the sugar. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Lane kind of has ADD too. I think he's like a, <laughs> that's why he's in, he's in denial. He'll, that's what t- we he'll <laughs> tell you about it. He'll tell you about it. Um, I'll let him tell you about it. But uh, yeah, he you know, and I think that can actually contribute if you can channel that into productive things, which I think Lane is an awesome you know uh, example. example of that, where he can channel. Uh, emotions he can channel ADHD and channel that into productive things that you know are helping people and and that's uh, we have a lot to learn from that so I think a lot of the high achievers out there uh, many of them are people that have you know ADD the classic picture of like Einstein's desk and it's just covered in shit and it's super disorganized and you hear that a lot about you know you know smart people so if you know I always say that when uh, people uh, uh, talk about how messy my car is on the inside yeah. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's like your Einstein. excuse. Yeah, I'm like Einstein. Yeah. What are you gonna do? Nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he tried to simplify. Like he didn't even wear socks because it was like another thing he had to think about. Like, <laughs> really? That's too yeah. much. That's just one too many things. Yeah. 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 Well, that's excellent, a- man. It's uh, it's great to have you on. Yeah, Dom. Man. It's been awesome having you down here, man. Yeah, definitely. Um, listen, if you like Mind Pump, go to mindpumpmedia.com. We have 30 days of coaching for free. This is where we take all of our past episodes and we compile them into different topics. So some one topic may be fat, maybe protein, maybe wellness. You'll get an email with bullet points on that subject and links to episodes time stamped so you can learn more about those particular subjects in detail. You can also find us on Instagram at Mind Pump Radio. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal, Adam at Mind Pump Adam, and Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.